we're asking this morning for great grace to be poured out in everything we do. We thank you, God, that we have the opportunity once again this morning to baptize some new believers in the faith into the church. We thank you for this blessing that we have. We thank you, God, for all that you're about to do this morning. And as you do it, we pray that you're glorified in every bit of it. We love you and we ask all this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Get around and welcome one another if you would.
ministry is doing a game day fellowship. That's going to be September 24th. That won't be next Sunday, right? That'll be a week from Sunday? No, it'll be this coming Sunday. Yeah. Wow. Man, I cannot believe September. So next Sunday, right after church, ladies, stick around. Uh, they're going to do a bingo game day. Now, you can bring your favorite snack food. And uh, Stephanie, if I beat this up, please interject. As I understand it, when you get here, just for showing up, you get one bingo card. If you bring with you um, coloring books, crayons, markers, anything that might be able to be used, we are supporting Cardinal Glennon uh, up in St. Louis. It's, a, it's actually the hospital that works with my grandson who has a heart issue. Um, anything that we can take to them, they have a little ministry there that you can donate to. It's really for little kids that are there going through the doctor and all that. So any, you know, I, I assume like books, reading books and things like that for little kids. If you bring a gift, you get a second card for free. So, uh, and any money that's brought in through that, is there going to be money involved? There won't be any money involved, so I don't even have to worry about that. I was going to say all that would go to Cardinal Glennon, but we'll just give it to the pastor and have dollars. Um, okay, also, you probably noticed out front, we have a diaper table. I really butchered that last week, so I'm not even going into that one this week, but if you could bring some diapers for the Shaw family, uh, bring those out, leave them there. I've already saw some folks that are bringing in some diapers. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we're going to leave that open for a couple more weeks, give everybody an opportunity to bless this young couple that's had their first baby. So we love that. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Marriage retreat sign up is also out there. Um, this is the Herman Turner's way to everybody. If you have any questions about the marriage retreat or you'd like to sign up, please see them right away. We'd like to start getting as many people on there as we can. There is a deposit this year that you're going to put down. $200 is all we agreed on, right? There's a $200 deposit that you put down, or you can go ahead and pay the entire cost up front, which is $400. That's fifty dollars more than what we did last year, and that is only because the hotel has raised those rates. That's not us trying to make money on it. It went up. Everything's going up. If you haven't noticed, we are really building back better. Um, but I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, the rates have went up, so we're going to have to raise a little bit of that. Now, listen. Let me just say with this marriage retreat thing, I don't want any couple not going to the marriage retreat because they don't have four dollars. If you really would like to go, there are ways we can help you get there. Please come see me if that's your situation. But we would love to have as many couples. I'd love to have 25, 30 couples at the marriage retreat. That'll be on Valentine's Day weekend in February, which I believe is the 8th, 9th, and 10th. Or 7th, 8th, 9th, somewhere in there. It's that weekend of, does that sound right? 9th through 12. It's on the sign-up sheet. So please sign up as quick as you can. Um, last but definitely not least, Next month, month of October, we're going to be devoting to missions. Um, I'm going to probably take a break from our study of the storyline of Scripture just through the month of October. And we're going to be talking a little bit about missions and giving. I'm going to be letting you know um, our current missions that we're supporting. Most of those are right here local. Um, but we need to branch out. We need to, folks, I'm telling you, God has blessed us, our church. And he's blessed us because he's, he is moving on the hearts of people to give. And we are sitting on a significant amount of money in the bank, well over almost $600,000. Um, we are not a savings account. That's not why the church exists. It exists to be a blessing. So we want to bless as many folks as we can. So we're going to be upping our missions giving. During the month of October, I'm going to be inviting some folks to come in and share with you what those ministries look like, what it is you're giving to. Uh, so, because we're already supporting some locally, we want to make sure you understand what's happening there where your money's going to. Um, that is the last of these announcements. I'd like to invite our water baptism candidates to come on forward. We have two, which is why I'm not wearing my mic. I don't want to get chopped up here. So, as you all know, uh, first of all, this is one of my favorite things to do as a church, is water baptism. And we've had a real blessing here lately. I don't know how many we've baptized in the last few months. I want to say probably 10 or 12, maybe. Um, God is doing some wonderful things in the hearts of people here. And one of the things I always want to make clear, and I was so glad when I met with these two kiddos today that they fully understood. I didn't tell them. I said, tell me, tell me what you think today's all about. And they knew right out of the gate. They, getting in that tank is not saving them. It's not getting them to heaven. Getting in that tank and being baptized is a message to all of you that they're well on their way to heaven. 
They've already accepted Jesus. That has been done. They've been declared righteous and holy. Today is a public profession of that. I also asked him, I said, why did we have to go all the way under the water? Why couldn't we just you know, walk by and sprinkle everybody? Uh, Kendall made a comment. I think he said something along the lines of, well, when you come up out of the water, it's like you're telling everybody you're a new person. And that is absolutely true. The Bible tells us that we, we are baptized with Christ in his death so that we can be resurrected in his new life. And that's exactly what water baptism is all about. They're going into the water, saying, hey, my old life is dying with Christ. I'm a new person coming out of here, and I want to walk in that newness of life. And our role as the church is to love them and support them in that process. Amen? I want to quickly introduce them to you. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. I already warned them and said, okay, all you got to do is tell them who you are. And if you can remember where you were saved at, you can tell them that as well. So you are? She was in a room reading her Bible a couple years ago, and she asked Jesus into her heart at that time. You are? And here during communion, he gave his heart to Jesus. Hey, you're a brother, right? Are you a good brother? Maybe. <laughs> you do know after today, you've got to be a really good brother. <laughs> Play it on heavy now. Hey, I'm super excited. They come from a great family. Appreciate their family being here. And we want to acknowledge their salvation together at baptism. Kiddos, are you ready for this? Come on over.
already here in this place and it doesn't matter how high we sing or how many songs we sing, God, you're here. And God, your presence is all around us. But God, I pray that this morning our hearts will be open and our eyes will be open and we will be made aware of your presence this morning, God, that you would speak to us. God, don't allow us to walk out of these doors here in a little bit and miss what you have to speak to us this morning. God, paid us in this place. In Jesus' name we pray.
right track. Today we're coming back to our series that we titled The Storyline of Scripture. This morning is going to be our 15th study in this, in this uh, series. We have been tracing the storyline of the Bible starting in Genesis 1. We've been walking through kind of a summary or a big picture of God's story. And it brought us last week to Joseph. And last week's message, I hope, I was able to help you see Jesus in Joseph. Because that's really what this entire study is about. I keep saying it over and over, and I'll probably keep saying it over and over until Jesus takes me home. God wrote a book, and it's all about his son Jesus. And we've got to understand how to read the Bible Christocentrically, with Jesus in the forefront of our minds as we read through these stories. And I pray that last week, once again, you saw... This beloved son who loved his father's home and became a servant. He was betrayed by his brothers. He was mistreated, unjustly punished, but eventually exalted to the right hand of the king. Now, who are we talking about there? Joseph or Jesus? And the answer is both. Joseph is what Paul calls in the book of Colossians a foreshadow of the one who is to come. He is a, he is a type and shadow that finds its substance in Christ. So that was our goal last week. Today I want to come back to the story of Joseph. I thought it warranted at least two studies, maybe more. Because this story, as I said last week, is a pretty significant piece of Genesis. At almost one third of the entire book of Genesis is made up of Joseph's story. So it feels like when God was inspiring who we believe was Moses, who wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, when God was inspiring him to write that, he got to the story of Joseph, and he basically said, whoa, whoa, just slow down a little bit. We're going to hit some details here. So I want to come back to this period in Joseph's life, which is something I didn't tell you last week. You go back and you do the math. It covers about 22 years of his life. At the time, he was 17 years old, and he was sold into slavery by his jealous brothers, all the way up to the time it says he was 30 years old when Pharaoh made him ruler over all of Egypt. And then we went through about seven years of, of plenty. And then they were about two years into the famine when Joseph's brothers came to buy food in Egypt. And so if you do all the math on that, Joseph would have been right around 30 years old when his brothers came and bowed down before him. And Joseph said, guess who I am? I'm your brother Joseph that you sold in Egypt. It would have been about a 22-year period, which would have made him somewhere around 30, maybe 31 years old. Now... As I said last week, there are a lot of life lessons you can draw from Joseph. As a matter of fact, it's a wonderful Bible study. There are tons of books you can go to the Christian bookstore, find commentaries and studies on Joseph. And I can tell you, I love studying the life of Joseph because there's so much meat here. There's so many things that are applicable to us today. But I want to remind you of something I said last week. And it's found here in Luke chapter 24. It's after Jesus was crucified, three days later he's resurrected. On that resurrection day, he shows up to his disciples and he says, in verse 44, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. The only scripture in existence at the time he said that was the old, what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. Now, we know Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples opening their minds to understand their Bible. So it is very likely he did the same thing we're doing. He probably started in Genesis 1 and walked them through the writings of Moses, the Psalms and the Prophets, and what is he doing as he walks them through all of those stories? He's pointing them to him. I do not believe Jesus was giving them life lessons to learn by. Hey, when you get to the story of Joseph, there's a wonderful example here. How to avoid temptation or lust or know how Joseph flee from Potiphar's wife. Hey, that's a great lesson. That is a wonderful lesson. But I don't think that's what Jesus he went through the scripture to show them how he is the fulfillment of all of these things. Now when we come to the story of Joseph, what specifically was he teaching them about himself? We don't know. We weren't there. But 
but I think we have some insight into what he was telling them. And if you're there in Luke chapter 24, go back to verse 26. The day he was resurrected, he's walking down the road to Emmaus. Two of his disciples are walking. He appears to them and he hides who he is. They don't, they don't know it's Jesus. And basically these guys are confused and they're like, we don't know what's going on. We had this Jesus from Nazareth. He was a man mighty and miracles and power. And we thought he was our Messiah. But then he let the Romans crucify. They nailed him to a cross. We don't get it. And I want you to look at verse 26. Jesus says, Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Folks, one of the things that Jesus' disciples struggled throughout his ministry to understand and one of the main reasons that he has been rejected as the Jewish Messiah, even Orthodox Jews today still reject him as the Messiah. Here's one of the number one reasons. Because he came and he suffered and he allowed sinful men to kill him. They can't get their heads wrapped around that. How would God's own son ever do that? Matter of fact, if you go back a year or so in Jesus' ministry, he's sitting around talking to his disciples one night. And he tells them in Matthew 16, it says that Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised. Man, that's pretty clear, right? And then listen to what Peter tells him in verse 22. Peter took Jesus aside and he began to rebuke him. He said, far be it from you, Lord. Lord, this should never happen to you. I can't even get my head wrapped around rebuking Jesus. But that's what Peter does. And you know why he's so worked up? Because this didn't fit with their understanding of who Messiah was. They thought Messiah was going to show up riding on a white horse with an army, was going to overthrow the Romans, and was going to set up this eternal kingdom where Messiah would sit on the throne of David and rule forever and ever and ever. But that day's coming. But it hasn't came yet. That's the part they miss. They miss the suffering. Peter and the apostles were totally confused initially about the suffering of our Lord. But before we're too hard on Peter here, don't we all wrestle with suffering? I'm going to tell you as a pastor, this has probably been one of the main questions that have came to me over and over. Can you tell me why I'm going through what I'm going through right now? Can you explain to me if God is all loving and all caring? Why does that happen? Why does this happen? Where is God in all of this? We all struggle. We ask these questions about suffering. And that's what I really want to make the focus of today's message. I want us to go back to this story of Joseph. And I want us to take a closer look specifically at his suffering, which I firmly believe points to our Lord's suffering. And then we're going to look at both of that, Joseph's suffering and our Lord's suffering, so that we can glean as much as we possibly can about our own suffering. So the goal of today's study is really this. I want us to learn how to suffer well. May we learn how to suffer for the glory of God. Because guys, at the end of the day, Jesus said it. He goes, in this world, you will have what? Tribulation. It also translates suffering. In this world, things are going to stink. In this world, bad things are going to happen. And then he says, take heart, I've overcome the world. So let's start looking at Joseph's suffering this morning. Last week, I walked you through the entire story, kind of gave you a summation of it, hit the high points. I hope you came away with a good understanding. If you weren't here last week, I'm sorry. I don't have time to do that again today. What I really want to draw your attention to today is this one question. Where did Joseph's suffering come from? Or who or what was responsible for all the pain and suffering that he went through? And I'm going to say it right out of the gate. Some of you are not going to like the answer to that question. Some of you may leave here today disagreeing with what I'm about to tell you. And that's okay because for years I struggled with what I'm about to preach. Still don't have it all figured out, but I'm going to share with you what I believe God has shown me in the scripture is the answer to this question. Where does Joseph's suffering, who is responsible for 
all the stuff he went through. Here it is. You ready? God is. God was 100% responsible for every bit of his suffering. Now listen, I am not saying that bad things came into Joseph's life and God used them for good. No, 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 no. I'm saying God authored them. God willed it. God designed it. God made it happen. Joseph's brothers selling him out of jealousy to the slave traders? God did that. The traders selling Joseph as a slave to Potiphar? God did that. Potiphar's wife falsely accusing Joseph of trying to attack her and having him thrown in prison? God did it. The cupbearer forgetting all about Joseph when he was restored to his position, causing Joseph to spend two more years in this dungeon? God did it. This huge famine that came on to the world and was wiping people out and they had to run to Egypt for food? God's doing it. Every bit of it. Some of you are, can you tell them the look you're giving me right now? I'm getting that. You better explain this one, brother. This doesn't sound quite right. I would not preach this this morning if I didn't think I had scripture to back it up. So let me show you why. Turn to Genesis chapter 41. Joseph, who was sold as a slave. 
His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron until what God had said came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. Folks, it is, in my opinion, it is undeniable in this story who's behind all the suffering. God is. And here's the big Go to chapter 50. This is probably the most quoted, probably most famous passage in all the story of Joseph. It's kind of like when you're studying that story of Queen Esther, and you get to that passage where Mordecai says, just perhaps you are here for such a time as this. That's probably the most famous line in all of the Esther story. This is probably the most famous line in all of the Joseph story. And it's misquoted over and over again. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Joseph's brothers come to him at the end of their life, and Joseph looks at them, and he says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And I hate to admit this, but I have misquoted this passage as well. Time and time again, I remember I have quoted Joseph wrongly, and I've said, hey, you remember when Joseph looked at his brothers and said, you meant evil against me, but God turned it around for good? That's not what it says. It says, you meant evil, God meant good. The word meant there, which I think the NIV translates as intended. You intended evil, God intended good. You may have another word there, but both the words are the same in both places. It's a Hebrew word I cannot pronounce. But it means you devised a plan and carried it out. Joseph did not tell them you devised a plan and you carried it out for evil against me, but God turned it around for good. He didn't say that. He did say, you devised a plan for evil, but God devised a plan for good. God had a plan from the beginning, and he carried out that plan at the hands of sinful people. And as you read through the storyline of Scripture, after we leave the story of Joseph, and you read on, you're going to find over and over and over again, God does this. God has something he wants to do. Folks, it's not just believers that he controls. He controls all things. The Bible says the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord, and he directs it wherever he wants. didn't say a Christian king. Any king. It's God's doing. And the result of this plan was the salvation of God's people. That's a big part of this story we haven't even talked about yet. Remember, we're in the part of the story that's dealing with the people promise God made to Israel or made to Abraham. That's what God's doing here. He's, he's building a people and he's preserving a people. And it is critical that we accurately understand and translate Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 because this verse points us to Christ's son. Let me ask you this. Some of you, I know, are fairly familiar with the New Testament. You probably, maybe you've at least watched the Passion of Christ. But you know a little bit about Jesus' death and resurrection. Let me ask you, do you remember in the story, who actually crucified Jesus? Who's responsible for his crucifixion? Well, Peter gives us some insight into this in Acts chapter 4. Peter's out preaching the gospel. This is after the resurrection. This is after the day of Pentecost happens. He's all fired up now. He's full of the Spirit. The, he's at the other apostles are with him. They're full of the Spirit. They're preaching. And he's standing in before a crowd of the Sanhedrin and the scribes. They call him in to question him and tell him, you better quit preaching in the name of Jesus. And here's what Peter says. Let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man who was just healed on the Sabbath, is standing before you well. Now, if you, if you stop there, you could say, well, Peter says that it's the Jewish leaders that were responsible for crucifying Jesus. But you have to read on. In the same chapter, in Acts chapter 4, verse 23, the apostles have been questioned, they've been released. Peter goes back, they're all celebrating now, and, and Luke records that they're all together, and when they were, were released, they went and found their friends, they were 
forward and all that the chief priests, the elders had said. And then verse 27, they began to cry out. And they said, truly, God, in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They were gathered together, Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and all the people of Israel. Look at verse 28. To do whatever your hand and your plan has predestined to take place. You ought to write Genesis 50 20 off to the margin of that verse. I want you to see this this morning, folks. The apostles' knowledge that our Lord's suffering and crucifixion, it was all part, it was, we can't blame the Jews. That's what's caused a lot of anti Semitism over the years. We can't blame the Jews for Jesus' crucifixion. We can't blame the Romans for crucifying Jesus. God did. It was his will. It was the predetermined plan of God, and God did exactly what he did in Joseph's story. God did for Jesus what was foreshadowed in Joseph. God used sinful men to carry out his predestined plan. There was no change in it. It was going to happen exactly as God decreed. And that plan also involved a great humiliation before glorious exaltation. What Joseph went through. 22 years of humiliation and then great exaltation to the right hand of the king. Jesus was persecuted and suffered and tortured and crucified. Great humiliation and then exalted to the right hand of the Father. Now here's where the rubber meets the road. I may run just a little long. I'm going to try to not, but here's where things get tough. What does all this mean in relation to our own suffering? Should we look at the suffering of Joseph and what the apostles proclaimed about the suffering of Jesus? And should we walk away from this believing that God is the source of all suffering? Well, historically, some of my Wednesday night Bible study guys are going to know where I'm going here. Historically, there's been kind of two different camps that you can belong to in how to preach or teach these truths. I have a lot of friends in one side of the camp who, they don't necessarily like this term, but we use it just for description. They, they're in the Reformed theology camp, and specifically Reformed Calvinism. John Calvin made this very popular. Basically, in that Reformed Calvinist camp, they would say that God is sovereign over all things, even the meticulous details of our lives. In other words, he has predetermined Every single event to occur. Good, bad, and ugly. They would even say that the Holocaust, as ugly as that was, was part of God's plan that he designed from the beginning. R.C. Sproul once said that every bird that has ever fallen from the sky and every nail that's been driven into a board has been part of God's predetermined plan. That's how meticulously he controls all things. The other camp would say, oh, humbug, not true. God has created us as free will people. Basically, he has told us, this is what I desire. And then it's up to us whether we, we are obedient to that or not. And then God is like a master chess player. Whatever move we make, he has a hundred other moves he can make, always directing us and guiding us towards his will. Or we can be totally disobedient and suffer the wrath of God. That's a very scaled down understanding of both of those kings. Here's where your pastor stands on this. I've struggled with it a long time, and I do not have it all figured out. People a lot smarter than me do not have it all figured out. But here's, here's where I stand on this. I believe to firmly plant your flag on either end is a mistake. I, I personally plant my flag on both ends. I know you're thinking, well, that's two flags. Why can't I have as many flags as I want? But that's what I do. I put a flag on both ends, and here's why. I can take you to stories throughout the storyline of Scripture, like the story of Joseph. This is one, by the way, that, that the Reformed camp leans on heavily. I can take you to stories like this one, and not just this one, many stories throughout the storyline where God is meticulously controlling every event of the situation. I just mentioned the story of Esther. We went and saw it here recently. You can't read the story of Esther without coming away thinking, 
my goodness, God is providential in all things. He works out all these little details and guides everything right to where he wants it. Wow. I would argue that's the main theme of Esther. But I can also take you to numerous places in Scripture where God says, here's what I want you to do. Go tell my people I want them to do A, B, and C. And if they don't, I'm going to do A, B, and C. And if they do, I'll do A, B, and C. You go tell them that. And the prophet goes and he tells them, and the people say, no way, we're not doing that. And then the scripture tells us God shows up again angry. And he brings his wrath and his judgment down on these people. In other words, God does not get what he desires to get. So he brings judgment. Meaning these people made three decisions. And it led to the wrath of God coming upon them. Or it led, they did what was right, it led to blessing. So I've taken the stand, and you don't necessarily have to agree 100% with this this morning, but I believe the scripture supports that God is providential when he chooses to be, and at other times, he shows us what he desires, and then he says, you choose today, you will serve. It's your choice. Which way are we going to go here? So as I begin to wrap this up, I, I, want to, I want to use all of this to kind of point you to what I believe should be a biblical response to our own suffering. How do we suffer well? How can we suffer for the glory of God? And first of all, I think we need to remember that there is biblical support, I believe, for at least three sources of suffering. When you're going through a terrible situation, there can be at least three Sources for that coming upon you. Number one, we find the principle of sowing and reaping. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul says, Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that he will also reap. Some of you may be in a season of suffering right now because you put yourself there. It's not God doing it. Not even the devil's doing You make horrible financial decisions. You get in over your head. You try to keep up with the Joneses. You do, you do all this. And, and then you look around and you say, Man, God, why am I always in financial trouble? Because you make dumb decisions. You're, making, you're reaping what you're sowing. You have broken relationships all over the place because you're always running your mouth and saying things you shouldn't be saying. That's just reaping what you're sowing. Oftentimes, our suffering is our own doing. The second source of suffering is living in a sinful, fallen world. And this is a response I probably give to people more than any other when I am asked, Steve, can you explain why my little boy is sick? Can you explain why these kids lived in a home where mom's boyfriend has abused them over and over and over? Can you explain that to me? I can't completely, other than telling them we live in a very broken world. As you all know, I have a grandson who has a heart issue. He's born with a, uh, an issue. He had to have a pacemaker put in up there at Cardinal Glennon. And when he was there, getting his pacemaker put in, my daughter and uh, Michaela and her husband Jordan, they met another couple. I don't even remember the couple's name. Um, but there was a little boy there who had had the same procedure, a little bit older. And just this past week, I think he's four. I think he's two. This little boy's four. This little boy got some terrible news. And I don't even know all the details. All I know is it's not good. So they're wanting to seek another opinion. They're going all the way to Baltimore, Maryland to try to figure out how they can save their son. Because if they don't get some better news, I don't know how long this little boy's going to make. So on top of all that, the dad is working two jobs. He has insurance. Insurance is picking up part of the bills. Other than the rest of it's building up. They're trying to figure out how they're going to fly to Baltimore, Maryland, how they're going to afford taking off these days of work, how they're going to make all of this work. The wife also works out of the home while she stays home and takes care of the little boy. I don't often do this, but I'm going to throw it out to you this morning. If you're looking to bless somebody, come see me. I can direct you to my daughter who set up a way to kind of help them. I think there's a GoFundMe account or something. Folks, listen. I don't even fully know. We don't have to know somebody 
intimately to bless them and help them, right? We're going to do that. I'm, I'm not asking you to do anything. Lori and I aren't already doing. If you want to be a blessing to these people, great. But here's where I'm going with all that. The only reason I mentioned it. I don't know why that little boy is going through life going through. And I can't imagine getting that news and being his parents. But here's what I do know. Those types of stories are all around us. And they're all around us because we live in a terrible world. We live in a world that is impacted by sin. Why do hurricanes show up and wipe out whole cities? Churches included, Christians' homes, unbelievers' homes. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust, right? Why? Because ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, Paul says it in Romans 8, he says, we know that the whole creation has been growing together in the pains of childbirth until now. In other words, all of creation was impacted by the sin of Adam and Eve. The third source of our suffering, and this is the one that doesn't set well with people, but the third source of suffering is sometimes God himself. He does at times bring us into seasons of suffering, just like he did Joseph. And listen, just like he did his own son, he does that. But what I have found in the scripture is that every time he does that, it's for a greater purpose. He's not like some sadistic little boy who's, you know, burning hands for the magnifying glass. That's not God. That's not why he brings us into seasons of suffering. He doesn't bring you into a season of suffering so you can say, let's see how much you can really take. No. If God is bringing you into a season of suffering, then clearly I can make a biblical case that he does that. He's doing it for a greater purpose. Job said, I look all around and I can't see God in this fire, but when I come forth, I will come forth as gold. God wants to bring us forth as gold. He sometimes is going to bring us into a season of suffering, maybe even a 22-year-long season, like Joseph had. And he's doing it just to bring us out of it later. All for his glory. We haven't gotten there yet, but this whole story is about how God's people got into Egypt. Clearly, God wanted them in Egypt. You know why he wanted them in Egypt? So he can deliver them out of Egypt. The great exodus of Moses and the children of Israel is one of the parts of the Old Testament that's repeated more than any other part in the New Testament. God has something there he wants us to see, so he's setting up the story to do exactly what he wants us to see, and that's for future studies. God wants us to see his glory in our suffering. Now I close with this. I do wrap up, I promise. How do we know which source of suffering we're dealing with? I don't think we can. So if you're going through a season of suffering right now, here's what I recommend. First of all, start with some self-analysis. Maybe you are reaping what you've been sowing. Maybe there's unconfessed sin in your life that you need to deal with, and God's trying to get your attention to deal with that. Now I say that cautiously. Because the devil loves to beat us up over past sin. If, some, if you're going through something and you think, wow, I wonder if this is because I, I did some horrible stuff when I was in high school. Ugh, treated people bad. Did this, did it. Listen, if you have confessed that sin, the Bible promises that sin is as far away as the east is from the west. God remembers it no more. And he's not going to bring judgment or suffering into your life anymore. So if you're searching your heart, you're like, you know, I, I think I've confessed everything, and you're still going through something, here's, here's what I would recommend beyond repentance or confession if there's something you need to deal with. I say we respond in faith, in hope, and in love. By faith, in my season of suffering, I will continue to believe that God sees everything that I'm going through. He's promised he'll never leave me or forsake me. I will hold on to the hope that I have a better home. This place is not my home. And one day I'm going to be home where there will be no suffering. Don't even be crying. Don't be nothing to cry about. There'll be no pain, no sickness, no taxes. There'll be none of it. So by faith I'll believe this. I'll hold on to the eternal hope that I have. And I will remind myself every day how much he loves me. 
Even when, like Joseph, circumstances go from pretty bad to real bad, in those moments I will still say, He loves you. I quoted R.C. Sproul earlier, and I want to quote him again. He says, When I think that I am unfairly hated, I try to remember that I am unfairly loved. God loves us. He sent his son to die for us. And folks, this is what drove the Apostle Paul and all of his preaching to endure the suffering he went through. He says in Romans 8, one of those famous passages, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. That's how you suffer the glory of God. You continue to remind yourself and you hold on to faith, hope, and love all the way to the bitter end if you have to. God will deliver you in this life or the next. But if you're a child of God, deliverance is coming. It's going to happen. That's our faith, our hope, and our love. Father, thank you this morning once again for the gospel, for the truth of Scripture. Lord, I thank you for seasons of suffering. Even the apostles preached that we should count it all joy when we find ourselves in various trials, various struggles, because this is, you are producing good in these things. And Lord, I'm sure this morning there are people here that are going through all kinds of different struggles. And Lord, if it's something, if they're reaping what they've been sowing, then I pray that you would bring that conviction upon their heart to confess that, to acknowledge it, and to turn from it. Lord, perhaps they're just feeling the effects of living in a sinful, fallen world. Or perhaps, Lord, you've you brought them into a specific season, for a specific time, and for a greater purpose. Lord, may we remember that oftentimes, Lord, your will is lived forward, but it's understood backwards. And sometimes we're not going to see what's going on. Lord, I don't believe Joseph even understood fully what was going on until right at the end of this story. He knew you were in all of it. Lord, help us to see and hold on to that today. And may we remember that if you are bringing us into a season of suffering, it is for our good and for your glory. Help us, Lord, as your church to suffer well to the glory of God. Before we go this morning, Father, I pray once again. For any unsaved people that are here, anybody that doesn't know you at all, they can't, they can't claim any of these promises for their own, because it all starts with Jesus. And I'm asking this morning that if there's anybody here and great grace has not flooded their heart, they've been born again to a new and living hope, and I'm asking right now that you do that. Lord, we know you're doing good work in this congregation. It's evidenced by the many baptisms that we've had. I thank you, God, for the work you're doing. I pray right now you continue that work in people's hearts. Our heads are bowed before we close in prayer. I want to know, if you're here this morning, you say, Steve, I know in my heart I'm not born again. I'm lost. I can't claim any of these promises this morning because they're not mine. I'm not a child of God. That can change. You can be buried with him in baptism, in his death, and be resurrected to a new life. If that's you, I want to pray with you this morning. Is there anybody that would quickly slip their hand up and say, please pray with me because I am not a born again believer. Anybody. Hand up and right back down. Thank you, Jesus. Stand with me if you would. Then. Lord, what another wonderful Lord's Day. Thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. Lord, you are so wonderful. And I just pray that you would help us to walk out of here today with the joy of the Lord being our strength. May we trust, Lord, that you are providential, you are sovereign. And somehow, all that comes together with us making decisions every day. And may we be wise and discerning in those decisions. May we make those decisions. May we live a life worthy of the gospel by your strength, that you're powerful working within us every day. I love this church. I love you, Lord, and all that you do. I pray your blessing now. And again, we pray all this in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Hey, folks, before you leave, real quick, my wife is going to yell at me because I forgot to pass this around. So please, if you haven't signed up, I'm going to put this back on the table. Uh, sign up for a trunk retreat. Also, next Saturday morning, we're doing a men's breakfast. We eat right at 7 o'clock Saturday morning. So fellas, come out and join us. Ladies, you're not invited. All right. Have a good day.